free to, uh, if you're going over to the meet, by all means, you're not going to offend me if you want to get up and head out. Uh, nutritional guidelines. I've probably got 60-some slides in here, 50-some slides in here, so I'm going to run through these very quick. By all means, uh, you know, contact me through Arvel or just call me at the university and I'll, I'll, I'll provide you everything we have on here. Uh, where to start? And, and again, this talk was more about hydration uh, and that than it is necessarily about protein. Uh, but where to start? And I put this on here. Yeah, explode that daggone pyramid. If there's anybody who doesn't know what they're talking about, who know a lot about what they're talking about, it's nutritionists. They change it every other day. Uh, what's good for you, what's bad for you. Uh, it changes all the time. So I don't worry about this too much. I worry about, I do worry about what you ingest and what you eat and how uh, that ties into your performance. Uh, obviously this was got some Marlin bias in here. Uh, consequences of poor uh, nutrition. And again, I'll make this available to you, but uh, you know, weight loss, lethargy, chronic fatigue, soreness, and, uh, micronutrient deficient, uh, ultimately down to overtraining. The bottom line is, if you're not eating healthy, you do run the risk, uh, a pretty obvious risk of poor performance. Okay. Uh, the basics, and again, I'm, uh, for time constituents here, I'm gonna run through this as quick as I can. Uh, we get about four calories per gram of carbohydrate, and you'll see these slides that move in and out between calories and grams, and so I want to cover that up front. Uh, protein gives us four, and fat gives us nine. We also need fiber. We get that primarily from eating healthy carbohydrates. Uh, we need water, and we need our vitamins and minerals, same stuff that we've had uh, for a long time. The other thing that I get up here, and I'm amazed that even as I get my juniors and seniors in college, uh, glucose, glycogen, sugar, carbohydrates, all the same thing fructose, sucrose, galactose, they're all forms of sugar, and uh, you can just think of it in that way. It's, it's sugar. Sample, you know, you can get into the biochemistry of it if you want, but we're not. Okay, carbohydrates are our primary fuel source. That's what you're going to burn first and foremost. Protein in use for growth, repair, and maintenance of tissue. The only time we really use protein in terms of an energy situation is when you are A, starved, or B, seriously physically challenged. Uh, right now, as you sit in here, it's probably 2 to 3% of your energy supply. You do break some down, but it's not. Fat and carbohydrates are your primary sources. Uh, protein use primarily for growth and repair. Okay? Fat being your secondary fuel source. And then obviously we need water, vitamins, and minerals again. Um, muscle is like a sponge, uh, and you need to keep it, it fueled on a regular basis. Uh, the carbohydrate, the sugar, you, you know, anybody who knows anybody who's a diabetic, take your blood sugars. You know, you eat five, ten minutes later, your blood sugars are high. It gets out to the working muscle very, very quickly, uh, considerably faster than protein does and even faster than fat does. Uh, we tend to burn it in the muscle as glycogen. It's carried around in the blood. It's called glucose. Uh, that's our difference. Uh, so glycogen or our stored sugar inside the muscle is our primary energy source. And again, I don't know how much of this stuff is review on here, but I'll try to move it as quickly as we can. Uh, high carbohydrate diet, and, that, and in theory, enables the athlete to train at a higher intensity for longer duration and enhances recovery. Uh, one of the things I joke about in class on a regular basis, why are most practices two hours in length? Why? Because you run out of your glucose, you run out of your glycogen levels in about two hours of sustained activity. It wasn't something that, you know, a hundred years ago we all somehow miraculously got into the biochemistry and figured out that two hours was an optimal practice time. No, two hours is when we all started getting too tired to focus anymore. Your neural drive starts to drop, your mental focus starts to drop, your fatigue starts to elevate, and they just started calling practices at two hours by accident. Now some of us push at 2.15. You know, I know basketball is going on in this town right now, and I absolutely love basketball, but there's nothing like the basketball people telling you how hard they work for two and a half hours, and it's like, yeah, the coach yelled at you for an hour and a half while you stood there. That's not, that's not a two and a half hour practice. That's nothing like we're talking about in two and a half hours of practice. Uh, you know, and there are days where they run, and don't get me wrong, but the bottom line is not that. For us going two and a half hours, that, that's some serious work. Um, 
Athletes should consume about 5 to 12 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body mass per day. There's a lot of stuff in here that the numbers will bounce in and around. Highly recommend if you're interested in it, let me know and I'll send this to you. Uh, there is one slide in here that I know is incorrect, so I need to make sure I address that. But you start doing the math on here on the low end, and the, the ranges are big because we got a 10-year-old kid who weighs 70 pounds, and we got a 20-year-old who weighs 200 pounds. Uh, so you have to take a look at the range. Uh, but the bottom line is we're getting about 10 grams. Uh, if you got 10 grams and you weighed 70, that's about 700 grams a day. 700 times 4, it's about 2,800 calories of carbohydrate a day. That's an awful, awful lot. That's a very high end. Uh, but a 200-pound athlete, that's, or 180-pound athlete, it might be. High carbohydrate diet. Uh, and it gets some values on there. For 100 pounds, is about 900 to 2,100 calories coming from carbohydrates. Again, depending on your intensity level and your training and your activity levels. Uh, for the most part, you should be on the low end before you're on the high end. Okay, protein. Adequate needed. We should consume about 1.3 to 1.8 grams of protein per kilogram per day. And same thing for a 100 pound person. This talk was given to age groupers as much as anybody when I originally did most of this. Uh, 500 to 800 calories. Okay, so 100 pounds, about 500 to 800 calories. You go back a slide. Uh, you're looking at about 1,400 calories on the very low end. You're looking at about 3,000 calories on the high end before you're getting into your fat. Um, bottom line with the protein, uh, this 1.3 to 1.8 grams per kilogram of body mass, if you start to identify that and look at that, you're in good shape. Our athletes who run, okay, need more protein. And it's, it's funny because the old adage back in the 70s and that was that the football players had to eat all this protein and the big guys had to eat all this protein. They don't. In theory, your 150-pound cross-country runner actually needs more protein than does your average football man. And it's because of all the physical pounding that they take, the constant pounding, they're breaking down the red blood cells just from the foot strikes and so forth. We don't have that in swimming, but we do have a long duration and a lot of intensity. So we're somewhere in the middle in there. Uh, you're probably, with regard to swimming, uh, if you're in that low range of this here, you're, you're probably good. Uh, if you have concerns, I would take it up. Okay? It will not hurt you to eat more protein. It actually will probably help you a little bit. Okay, high fat intake and diet should be avoided. We know that. Uh, if you can consume a gram per kilogram less, uh, again, a 70 kilogram person weighing about 160 pounds. Uh, I probably got numbers on here too. Okay, for a 100 pound person, the same guy, it's about 450 calories. So again, that low level diet's up to about 22. That high end diet's up to about 3,500, uh, depending on how you are and uh, standard breakdowns. And it's got a visual on this. I still stick with the old 50, uh, 55 to 65 percent on the carbohydrates. The key to this is, from what we were probably taught when most of you were in school or some of the original stuff that came out, is the protein portion is higher. If you go into your high school PE books, they'll probably have this protein at 10 percent, and they'll have the fat up around 30. Nice, easy to deal with numbers: 60, 30, 10. Uh, I wouldn't, I would cut the fat down, I would increase the protein up. And if your athletes are training hard, I would be on the high end of the protein. Uh, it will not hurt them, it'll balance their glucose numbers out, it'll balance their sugar fluctuations, it'll maintain a feeling of fullness, they'll get enough energy. If they're not getting enough energy, you'll, you'll know it, they'll know it. They'll fail in various other ways. They won't be completing their sets, they'll be dragging. Uh, they won't sleep well at night, there's a lot of things that'll go on. So if you don't think they're getting enough calories, you can bump that up. But I would have this on the high end, uh, especially for developing 10, 12, 14, 15-year-old guys who are going through a lot of growth. Uh, I would have that for sure on the high end of that. And again, their high school textbooks and their PE class, their fit for life classes type of things will have it at 10%. Uh, water, again, I don't know how long we want to be on this. You can't live without water, okay? You got about two, three days and before you go. You got about a month with regard to food. So hydration is crucial uh, before, during, and after. Uh, we don't think about it very often because we don't think about the sweat losses in the pool. But yes, the kids do sweat in the pool just like they'd sweat anyplace else. Uh, 
you know, they dissipate the heat a little bit differently, but the mechanism for sweating is still there, and they do lose uh, quite a bit of fluid volume. Um, <clears throat> dehydration, uh, probably the single most important factor with regard to performance that you have. Maybe not in a 50 free. I will tell you it starts to creep in in a 100. It's there for sure in the 200. And in a 500 free, it's there, no doubt about it. It's probably the single most important thing you can control and single most important detriment to performance that's out there. And again, that's my opinion, but I teach it that way in class. Uh, hydration levels are just crucial. And there's, uh, I have a, a slide coming up that shows you part of it. Okay, water versus sports drinks. Less than 90 minutes, we should be drinking water. Over 90 minutes, you should have some kind of a supplementation that has a carbohydrate beverage in it. Again, round numbers, if your practice is two hours, that's your call. If it's an intense two hours, you probably ought to be thinking about adding more than just water uh, to the regimen. If it's you know 90 minutes of work and then some easy swimming, some drilling, and not that big of a deal, you're probably still fine with water. But typically, uh, 90 minutes is our breakdown where they need to start having uh, some additional glucose uh, fueling the system. Okay, electrolytes, fancy name for salts, okay, and carbohydrates. Yes, you sweat as much in the water. Okay, most beneficial sports drinks. We don't have this problem anymore. We had the problem back in the 80s when the sports drinks first came out. Uh, Gatorade shares all of their information now. They weren't necessarily the quickest to divulge it back when they were first developing it, and rightfully so. Uh, but a lot of people, there's that miracle 6% sugar solution where Gatorade goes into your stomach and it'll cross the, the gut or the lining of your stomach, and basically it'll equal water, or at least it'll cross the stomach lining at the rate of water. So you can get sugar into your system just the same as if you're drinking water. If you get up over 6%, you start to get to 7% or 8%, uh, it'll slow the gastric rate down. You start drinking a Coke or orange juice, they're at like 12%, it'll slow down your gastric emptying, so it'll stay around in there and slosh. It's a reason why you can't supplement with certain drinks. When we first had the uh, sports drinks come out, well, Gatorade's got 6%, so we're gonna put in eight. There were a lot of bad sports drinks on the market in the late, you know, mid, early, late 80s. Uh, but they've pretty much all gone by the wayside now that Coke and Pepsi are in charge. Uh, they're all pretty much 6%. I think Coke or Powerade contains just a little bit more. That's, okay. Uh, okay, how it works. Bottom line is our sweat rate increases if we're dehydrated. Uh, the blood volume therefore decreases and therefore the heart rate has to go up. So anything that requires an increased level of heart rate the workload or the, the effort that you have to put into it to balance it off is changed uh, when we decrease our blood volume. Okay? Our temperature then goes up and the cycle just continues on. In order as our core temperature goes up, even in the pool, we then turn on the mechanism to sweat more. We sweat more, we lose more blood volume, the heart rate has to go back up and therefore the temperature goes back up and we keep going in the wrong direction. You don't want to be dehydrated. Uh, no doubt about it, when we sit here and we see these performance studies, I talked a lot about evidence-based in the last hour, but when you see these performance studies, it's something that's left out of those equations all the time, and it shouldn't be. If we're going to go out and take some XYZ drug and then swim for two or three minutes and see if it benefits you or whatnot, you have to know where the hydration levels are because it can change from day to day and affect your performance. Uh, and it's something that's overlooked in, in research all the time. Okay. So less O2 available, more reliance on the anaerobic system, more reliance on the anaerobic system ultimately results in cramping and so forth. Your signs for, <coughs> excuse me, for dehydration, we're pretty much familiar with those. Uh, I'll keep moving through them. Uh, the dangers of dehydration, as small as 2%, and you have to keep in mind that once you start to feel uh, thirsty, you're already in the state of dehydration, okay? You're probably at that 2% level. Your thirst mechanism is a protective mechanism and it follows it up, it's behind it. Excuse me. So if you're, if you're waiting to drink until when your athletes are sitting there telling you, well, I'm not thirsty, uh, that's not a correct answer. The thirst mechanism kicks in too late. Not too late, but definitely uh, out there. If you get to the 4% level, uh, you definitely have a decreased capacity for muscular work. 
5%, you're looking at exhaustion, hallucinations, and then ultimately looking at death if you don't uh, take care of yourself. Okay? Again, as small as 2%, as small as your urine color, uh, that's not a good slide. Uh, basically, that's clear, and that's almost black. And, uh, you know, one through three, the bottom line is you should have a very light-colored urine. Your athletes should. I would talk to them on a regular basis. If you are seeing somebody who looks sluggish in nature, it's, a, you know, it's hard for a 50-year-old man to ask the 15-year-old girl what color her pee is, but you ask them, okay? And they, hey, and you just gotta spin it. But the bottom line is they need to be, uh, their urination needs to be light in color. And again, that, that slide's not too good. Um, and not to gross anybody out, but when you go into the locker room and you can smell the urine, especially on the guy's side, that's because everybody peeing in there is down in this range and it's yellow and it's darker yellow, it's turning towards brown, and you're smelling everything that your kidneys are getting rid of. Uh, it's not the urine itself, it's, it's all the other toxins that your body's thrown out. Um, so if you have just your swim team in there and you can smell the bathroom, it's time for some of them to start drinking more. Uh, if it's four to five, you're slightly dehydrated and need to drink more, uh, you're definitely dehydrated in six to seven and you need to call 911 if you get to eight. I uh, wouldn't wait around on it. All right, what we know about drinking, um, we're fickle, okay? Cold water versus warm water, it absorbs quicker? Nah, that's, that's arguable, okay? They can drink warm water. The problem is they won't drink as much, okay? It just doesn't, the, the palate isn't pleased as much. It wants to be cooler, especially when they're exercising. The bottom line, if it's hot water, if you put in hot tea or something like that, that's, that's going to change it. But just room temperature water, it won't make a difference. So when they tell you they don't want to drink and it's room temperature, it's not going to slow down the, the gastric rate. That's, that's questionable. Um, the cold, they'll absorb more and they'll, they'll drink more if it's cooler. Tends to taste better. Uh, can it cool down the body temperature? It can at least make you feel that way. Uh, whether it does or not, there's so many other mechanisms. It depends on how warm it is, whether it does it. Uh, okay, uh, fluid replacement beverages. Um, carbohydrates and electrolytes in there on our sports drinks increases the thirst for water. Okay, and lasts longer than 90 minutes. That's what I was there before. Flavor and taste is crucial. There's a reason why Gatorade uh, originally started out with, what is it, lemon lime? They basically had yellow and they had orange. And we were all fine with that in the 80s. Well, then as the competition came in, then there's yellow. They figured it out real quick. It's appeasing to the eye, pleasing to the eye, to see the different colors. And if you notice, if you look at uh, uh, Powerade, Powerade has, it's more fluorescent in color. That's not, that's not an accident. That's a marketing scam or a marketing ploy. I don't know if it's a scam or not, but they're trying to sell it to the 10-year-old kids. Their purple looks cooler because it's slightly brighter than the Gatorade's purple, okay? Exact same stuff. But uh, flavor out there, taste, all that stuff's crucial. The bottom line is if your son or daughter, if your athlete wants orange Gatorade, then give them orange Gatorade, okay? Don't, uh, don't limit them to, well, you know, I say this as a parent to my wife all the time, if the green Gatorade's on sale, don't buy it because my kids won't drink it. You know, they, they like their certain colors. You've got to get it to them. When they like a color, they like the taste, they'll drink more, they'll replace more, they'll do everything they're supposed to do. So don't fight them on it because they inherently will, you'll lose that battle. Um, location, location, location. We'll go back over to the, uh, to the basketball tournament again. And it cracks you up. You see it on TV, and there's the you know the student manager whose one job is to take the Gatorade bottle and stick it in the player's face as he comes off the bench, and they smack him half the time because they don't want it. But what do they do? They go back there and stick it in their face again. They've done studies on uh, they've done quite a few studies, but like a room this size, it would be say a weight room. If we put one drinking fountain in the corner, they won't go drink. If you put a drinking fountain on all four walls, they'll drink on a regular basis. I mean, if it's close, they'll go drink. If they have to walk, they won't do it. I don't know, there's something about human nature. So the bottom line in a pool, 
when we get to that point in the season where I know they need to be, you know, our intensity's up, our duration's up, everything's up, I get the water bottles right out front and I put them right there in front of their face. And yes, I do not, it does not bother me to go be their water boy and go get it filled back up. If they're low, I'll even ask them if that's what they need. And, you know, if I got somebody else there helping me, that's fine. But if not, uh, I get it and I get it right there in their face. And I will even sit there and pick up the water bottle and I'll watch a kid and I'll put it right in front of him without saying anything. The location is crucial. They won't drink if they're not, you know, they don't like the flavor, they don't like the taste. Uh, the location is everything. So you've got to match those things if you want them to stay hydrated. <clears throat> All right, uh, just to look at some of the old stuff and why we've got to stay away from certain things. All Sport, Powerade. Uh, Powerade has got a tad bit more sugar. High fructose corn syrup, not as good. Gatorade, I would definitely take Gatorade over Powerade, but that's me. Uh, sucrose and glucose. You'll notice uh, if, it's, if you find an off-the-wall brand, you go into Odd Lots and every once in a while you find some uh, drink you've never heard of, keep an eye on the fructose. Fructose is slower, and for whatever reason, the molecular structure of it's slightly different. It slows the gastric emptying rate. So you'll see Gatorade has a little bit of it in there, but not much, okay? And that's because it slows it. So they, they do know what they're doing. Uh, but if you get one that's doing the high fructose corn syrup, uh, definitely don't want it up there much more. And again, I would say that Powerade will sit in your stomach a little longer than Gatorade will. You get down to the energy drinks, you got to stay away from this stuff. Obviously, it's all sugar, 12%, uh, Coke and orange juice. I joke with my students all the time, when I used to run triathlons post-swimming, I did run a triathlon once where I had a water bottle of Coke and a water bottle of water because if I drank one and then drank the other the whole way through, I would cut that in half and make it 6%. It didn't work. Uh, and it stays in your stomach and it's pretty gross. I was throwing up in the middle of that triathlon on a regular basis. Uh, don't do it. Uh, it doesn't like the type of sugars that are in there. Uh, all right, and just some highlights on there. The sodium or the electrolytes, uh, that's an awful lot of salt in Red Bull, uh, let alone all the caffeine that's in there. It's like four cups of coffee. It's, it's not good stuff. All right, when we should drink, um, for the matter of time here, I'm going to cut through some of these a little bit quicker. Uh, it's got charts on here and everything. You, you can probably Google and find those things, or again, I'll send it over to you. Uh, what should we eat before exercise? Uh, and it's giving you, again, timetables on what you should be doing, or at least what the recommendations are out there. Um, four grams per kilogram of body weight four hours beforehand, and then one gram. Again, you'd have to do the math for you, and a small amount of protein uh, in there as well. Okay, fiber and fat, you want to keep that down. The reason why you want to keep down the fat, you definitely on your pregame meals and that, fat needs to be at its lowest because fat is the slowest by far digesting. It's about four times slower than carbohydrate is in terms of digesting. So if you don't want something that feels heavy on your stomach, you got to stay away from the fatty, uh, fatty meal, no doubt about that. Uh, okay, I'll keep... Okay, and same thing here for the, uh, for the carbohydrates. Okay, and it's back into that 30, 90 minutes. All right, recovery. We definitely need 8 to 6 ounces or 16 ounces. We need it right away. 40 to 60 grams ASP on the carbohydrates, and that needs to be within the first 30 minutes. If you've got athletes in high school who haven't eaten since 11 o'clock in the morning, they practice from 3 to 5, and they've got to go do something till 6 till 7 till 8 at night, they are putting themselves at a severe disadvantage in terms of their recovery. It just won't happen. The sponge-like <clears throat> excuse me, effect of the, of the working muscle is enhanced those first 20 to 30 minutes afterwards. And there's, there's debate on that in the scientific literature. But in essence, you got more, you got to increase blood flow into the muscle, you got vasodilation, all the machinery, if you will, is turned on because we're trying to clear out the stuff we don't want. And therefore, if we can get the carbohydrate in there, the sponge-like effect works. Um, you want it there for sure. So that first 30 minutes, even if you've got a 20, 25-minute ride home, they should be snacking on something in the car 
when they are in their highest forms of training. I would have them snacking on something. Get some food in them. It'll start to enhance the recovery process. Okay. And then two-hour intervals up to four hours after exercise, it gives you some recommendations there. Okay. Uh, all right. That window for refueling, 30 minutes, is critical. Uh, gly glycogen repletion occurs faster after exercise, increased blood flow, and increased enzymes. This stuff, like I said, it's going on. 20 to 24 hours post-exercise, uh, you want to maximally reply all the glycogen you lost, but it's on the same window time frame as, as normal, okay? But that first 20, 30 minutes while you're still circulating blood is when you can get a lot more bang for your buck. Um, same thing's pretty much going on with protein. To enhance the protein synthesis and replace the glycogen stores, uh, first of all, don't exercise in a fasted state because it will pull more on the protein. We don't want that, so you need to be topped off before you exercise. Eat immediately after or in that same 30-minute window. This is a slide that's wrong. That should say about 25 grams of protein, so about 100 calories of, of protein. Um, and there's four or five slides that come up later on that, that have the correct value in there. I'm not quite sure how I made that mistake, but I noticed it. Uh, again, it's about 25 grams of protein, and then you got one, uh, one and a half carbohydrate per kilogram. That's just straight protein. It doesn't matter who you are, how big you are, you need about 25 grams. Obviously, if you're 6'5 and 200 pounds, maybe you need 30, uh, but it's around 25 grams. Okay. Um, the type of protein that you eat has uh, a definite effect on, on the replenishment. Uh, this is uh, two graphs taking a look at whey protein. Whey protein is fast acting. Cassian protein is slow, anti-catabolic versus anabolic. We want the fast protein because we want to rebuild, we want to regenerate, we don't want it tearing down. Okay, so where are we getting these? These are basically your milk proteins or the standard proteins we think of. Uh, <coughs> cow's milk, water, lactose, okay, 20% of total milk protein. Yeah, I thought there was another one out there. Uh, it helps in terms of weight loss. If you're eating a whey protein or getting your through, you know, your dairy products and that uh, through cow's milk, the whey protein because it fulfills the fillness. Rather than having that glucose spike, you have a spike on the protein as well, which gives you a feeling more of complacency that I'm full, and therefore you tend not to eat as much. Uh, and it also then works its way out a little bit slower than the glucose does. Just simply glucose or sugar by itself, you get the spike, it comes back down, and you're hungry again five, ten minutes later. Uh, and that's what you don't want. So in weight loss, that's how it's used. Uh, if you're trying to lose weight, definitely increase your protein intake for sure. It'll help you slow down your carbohydrate intake. Uh, increased lean muscle mass has a branched chain amino acids will also boost the immune system. And the products that typically have the whey proteins, milk, cheese, ricotta, yogurt, soup stock. You won't find the calcium protein too much out there. Uh, you know, go into GNC and you can probably find it. Uh, you want to stay away from that. And if your kids are supplementing with protein, make sure they're not supplementing with a calcium protein. Okay, it's to build, it's to break muscle down and replenish it. We don't want that. We're already doing that with our exercise, so you don't need any more of it than what's already there. Okay. Uh, decreased recovery times and faster muscle repair, that's ultimately what we're trying to get at. Uh, no side effects from it, and then a timeline with regard to the protein. And again, more than anything else, or fat, fat's about four to one in terms of how long it takes to get out of the system. Protein about two to one. Sugar, depending on what type it is, the glycemic index, it can be almost immediately into your system if it's pure table sugar. Uh, or pure, pure glucose, or it can be, you know, put a baked potato on your tongue and that starch will take a while before it breaks down, but it will break down. <clears throat> so anyway, we want this balance in there. We want that protein in there. We can't eat too much because it'll slow and it'll interfere with the carbohydrates. So immediately post-exercise, that's why you're capped at about 25 uh, grams. Even if you're bigger, maybe it's a little bit more, but you don't want too much in there because you don't want it slowing down the effect of the carbohydrates getting back in and refueling the muscle as well. Um, all right, pre-event meals. I'll run through that. Pre-event meals. Energy drinks. Uh, they're, they're scary. Uh, Red Bull is the first one. Austria and Europe. Tons of sugar and caffeine. 
and then their marketing ploy, they almost every single one of them puts something else in there to make them look cool or whatever. Hit America in the mid 90s and when I put this originally together, this slide here was about four years ago, there were over 500 different energy drinks that you could find in the supermarkets. Maybe not in yours, but across the country there's over 500 of them out there. That's big business. Uh, it's big business that's not necessarily healthy. I would keep your athletes off of them, you know, no doubt about it. They're designed for appealing. Again, we talked about the color, uh, sugar and caffeine. Oh, okay. Um, all the good stuff. Caffeine, typically in a cup of coffee, is about 70 to 140, depending on you know, how you brew it and who, what kind of bean you use. Um, but they're, you know, most of those energy drinks are probably four times that. That's the selling point, <clears throat> excuse me, behind five-hour energy is they don't put caffeine in there. They use B vitamins to kind of do the same thing. Uh, probably definitely better uh, definitely better than Red Bull and that kind of stuff. Uh, six to nine teaspoons of sugar, that's, that's pretty, that's a lot. Okay, and most of them are more servings than what, you know, the can is. You'd be surprised on some of them. Yeah, there's only, you know, 100 calories in this can, and you find out that one can has five servings. They, they manipulate things quite a bit on those uh, energy drinks. All right. Uh, how much protein is enough for recovery? And again, these are questions that I, I put out here. The range is 15 to 25. That slide up there earlier was wrong. And the research behind it, uh, they were fed 5, 10, 20, and 40 grams of protein post-workout, and 20 grams produced the maximum effect. So again, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on how big you are. But to enhance that supplementation post-exercise, it wants to be about 20 grams. Okay, just read the back of it, whatever you can get your hands on, about 20 grams of protein. The carbohydrate then is definitely tied into how big you are. Okay, uh, you know, 180 pounds versus 100 pounds, and it's a gram per, per kilogram of body weight. Okay, timing, don't delay on it, 15 to 25 grams within 30 minutes. Get it in there while the muscle is fueled or while the muscle is ready to be fueled because it's got all the blood flow and all the enzymes, all the machinery is still turned on. Okay, uh, the muscle stimulation supposedly is three times greater if you take it immediate versus three hour delay. Again, once, the, once you get back to baseline and homeostasis post-exercise, then you're into regular eating patterns and you don't have that increased blood flow, you don't have an increased delivery, all that stuff is, is decreased and it goes back to normal. So again, some, some good research on there, three times uh, greater if we can get it in immediately. So, you know, definitely if you're in Chicago and you got a 25-minute car ride home because of traffic or DC or something like that, those kids definitely need to be eating, you know, they need to be eating immediately. All right, <clears throat> how much carbohydrate do I need for recovering this timing and intake? Okay, and the same thing, 0.5 grams per pound or 1.1 grams per kilogram. Uh, 150 pound person, it's about 75 grams. 75 times four, it's about 300 calories, okay? It's a snack, uh, trail mix kind of stuff, perfect for something in the car, gets them a little bit of protein. Uh, trail mix with a little bit of um, M&Ms in there, it's pretty good stuff. Uh, that'll, that'll do the trick. Definitely to get you to the home where then you can hopefully eat a good meal. Uh, rapidly absorbed simple carbs will tend to speed the recovery more than slower to digest carbs. This is the one time when you do want a simple sugar. You want one that gets right across the system and gets right into the blood. The problem with it is don't follow it up with a meal at home with simple sugars. You've got to follow it up with more of your complex starches, your potatoes, your beans, and, and so forth that take a little bit longer to, to break down. So contrary to what we're typically talking, yes, get it in the form of Gatorade. You know, Gatorade and some peanuts will be perfectly fine for the ride home. Get your sugar in, get it in a simple form, uh, and don't, don't worry about you know, making it the best carbohydrate possible. Okay? And then don't eliminate the fact that you still need to eat appropriately once you do get home. Just because you had a snack and maybe you feel better, uh, that doesn't substitute for the fact you need to replenish everything else. Uh, I heard a 4 to 1 ratio or a 3 to 1 ratio of carbohydrate to protein is best for recovery. Is that true? And it's the math down here that's not because it's not the carbohydrate, yes, 
Uh, you have to watch that, but the protein you don't. That's stuff I talked about up there. You want that 15 to 20 grams, and they just got math down there. 120-pound uh, athlete, 60 grams, 15 to 25. It's a 2 to 4, uh, you know, versus 3 to 6, and 4 to 8 to 1. So uh, it changes depending on how big you are. The carbohydrates drive it, not, not the protein. Eat the protein as, as you want. That was about as quick as I could run through that as possible. I apologize. I will take questions from anybody who has them. Yep. Uh, I get out of bed at 5 a.m. I'm getting in the water at 5.30 a.m. Any uh, nutritional guide for that first, for that morning swim? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it would start out with when they last ate in the evening. You know, did they eat appropriately? They ate at 6 o'clock, and we're talking, you know, almost 10 hours post-dinner, uh, 11 hours post-dinner, then I would suggest they do eat something uh, beforehand. I would think along lines very similar to what you would want to do immediately after dinner. You want it in the form of a simple carbohydrate so it gets in quickly, but you don't want it to be... Uh, you know, you don't want that to be your entire meal because that'll spike you right out of there. And I wouldn't eat too much. It's just to turn it on, if you will. The, um, you also wouldn't want something that's heavy in fat. If it drips, you, don't, you wouldn't want it at that time because that's just going to sit in the stomach and it's, it won't digest the entire time you're at practice. You'll just feel miserable. As a recently diagnosed diabetic, uh, yeah, I'm learning to like those things an awful lot. Uh, they are balanced. Um, it, it might be the perfect solution. Uh, I used to drink the Nestle Quick Ones because they were more sugar oriented. Now I drink the healthy diabetic ones uh, as much as anything because of the balance in there and it keeps my blood glucose levels down and I think that's what they want. So would I recommend that you do the Insure or Glucerna, maybe not, but that's what you want. So if you take a look at what the mixture is, you just want to make sure you're balanced like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Have you ever heard of uh, Phase 3 recovery drink? Uh, name sounds familiar, but I'm not familiar with it. Is that what it is? Okay. So if it's skim milk protein based and it's a whey protein, it's a faster reacting recovery drink. Um, I'd probably find it in 30 seconds. It won't take that long. I'll probably find it over here at the meet. Um, swimmers are notorious for their recovery drinks. Uh, a lot of them are involved in it. Yeah. Um, you know, I've heard about it because my students, whenever we talk about these things, they're always bringing up new ones. But like I said, there's over 500 different drinks. Most of them nowadays, they're generally pretty good because there's enough science out there to know that you can't have, uh, like you said, it's a skim milk, okay? It's a fat-free milk, which is what that's saying, and it's milk protein. So they got the fast-absorbing milk protein and they've got the fat eliminated from it. So that's what I'm saying. They, they kind of know enough now. It's almost hard to have. Other than the energy drinks, those things are crap, and they're, Lord knows what's in there. Most of your recovery drinks are good. That brings up the point, too. you got to watch your athletes. You can't drink a recovery drink before exercise, and you can't drink it during. Some of those things are bad if they're taken at the wrong time. So make sure they're aware of that, too. Uh, like gator load, you, you don't want gator load five minutes before your exercise, it'll kill you. I mean, it, you know, you'll, you'll, it'll sit in your stomach, it's designed to do things differently. Um, for lack of anything else, I would trust Gatorade, they, they know exactly what they're doing. Um, the instant breakfast, I just used to like them, and that's what I drank when I was an athlete, and even doing triathletes, if I, and triathlons, if I go out in the morning for something, just because I felt the need to drink something, that's just me, psychological as much as anything, and they were fairly balanced. Like I said, now I've shifted into 
the diabetic stuff because, I mean, uh, about 53 weeks ago right now, I woke up and my blood sugars were like 300 out of the blue. I mean, I'm 6'1", 165 pounds. That's, I mean, I don't know. My, I'm off my medication now. Things are going well, but it just died, I guess. I don't know. I'm, they shut me down. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, for a young, healthy athlete, if, if they like that, um, maybe it'll, there's generally enough protein in there, but they're almost getting all their protein from those out of the drinks or out of the milk. Uh, so I think the insurer's better, but I wouldn't spend the money for it. Um, just the digestibility on it is the concern I have. I wouldn't have it first thing in the morning, but that's me. Uh, they're typically designed uh, to be a slower digesting. Um, you'd really have to take a look at which ones, and I'd have to study Power Bar and what it, exactly its ratios are. Um, they've been in the business for a long time, though, so they're probably pretty balanced. And if they say they take it pre-meal or post-meal or whatever, I would do their recommendations. Sorry, I don't, I don't know that one anymore. Okay. Uh, I don't know how long it's been around. Uh, 20 years now, maybe. But at the high school level, I've never heard of anybody doing it at the high school level. Uh, kind of like the compression garments came in the fad about five, six years ago and quickly disappeared because a lot of money for nothing. Um, the ice baths work if you can tolerate it. Um, the first time I, I heard about the ice baths was in the 90s, and a young girl's name was like Sherry White, I think. She was an Ohio backstroker, went to USC, and the football player, I want to say Roger Craig, uh, was a really good running back, and he took ice baths. And he explained all of his stuff, and then that made its way down to USC, and it made its way back to us in Worthington when I was there. But um, yeah, she was taking ice baths to help aid recovery from her triathlon days. She was out of swimming at that point in time. Um, but uh, yeah, she was, uh, it was the rage back then. And it's never really gone away. It is beneficial if you are getting physically pounded on. I'm not sure in swimming we take the physical pounding that you know, a running back does. It's a different we drain ourselves, but we're not getting punched and beat up. I mean, there's a reason why we can go two hours almost nonstop. You can't go out and run at that intensity for two hours. You can't come close to it. I mean, one or two psychos can, but 99% of the population can't do it. So swimming is its own breed. There's nothing unhealthy or dangerous about it other than jumping into ice. I guess you could go into shock. Oh, but. I mean, well, I mean, you run the risk of going into shock walking down the street for a whole variety of reasons, so I wouldn't worry about it. No. Post-recovery, or post-workout recovery, one of our higher-level club coaches said, you know, after all is said and done, it still turns out that the best post-workout recovery nutrition is peanut butter sandwich and chocolate milk. Yeah. Comment? True. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't hesitate with it. The uh, research study that I wasn't supposed to talk about, it's, it's the chocolate milk study. I'm not supposed to say anything about it. But milk now supports us in swimming. And I hope Joel Steger, no IU people are here, he'll kill me. Um, they've got a huge grant to do it. The Got Milk people just realize that there's no research out there in swimming. And they're a swimming supporter. All that research is done on the bike. So don't, pu don't publish that, Brad. No, no, no. Um, yeah, there's everything out there, there, that's the way I understand it, and that's why he's coming to me, he's trying to find, he's got to get around his numbers and he's got to get some swimming data out there for him because they're supporting swimming and there's no swimming data. Would there be much of a difference between creamy peanut butter versus this big chunky stuff? Um, you'd have to look at the breakdown on it. The creamy will digest quicker because you don't have to, so it would, I would say, yeah, it's probably better. Uh, the peanuts would have to go through the mechanical process of breaking it down. Uh, you get some of that through chewing, but 
you know, any of the granules that make it down in your stomach are going to take time and acid. Uh, it's pure sugar. I mean, it, it's, it's, no, it's a pretty good balance for immediately right after. Uh, again, you're, you're trying to get the caloric intake up, say 300 calories. That's, that's a pretty good sandwich. It's got the sugar in there, it's got the simple sugar in there, and it's got just enough protein to keep it smooth. You want that steady flow in, but you want the steady flow in fast. I mean, you don't, you don't want it to be sitting there for hours. You don't want to eat a baked potato and not chew it. Uh, so you're getting it from the jelly, and then just enough protein to keep, keep the sh blood sugar levels balanced. Because uh, there's the sugar in the chocolate. There's more sugar in there. Basically, chocolate milk is milk with a bunch of Hershey syrup, you know, stuck in there, and that's all pure sugar. So you got your protein base from the milk, and you got your sugar. And they did it up here at IU. I shouldn't speak for them because I don't know, but basically on a whim, they just like pfft, looking at these recovery drinks, and it's like, oh, hell, I'm going to drink chocolate milk. And then they decided to do a study on it, and then they found out it worked as good if not better and next thing you know they've you know they've got one of the most popular uh what do you want to say stories that get out to the lay public is any of them that are out there and i said if i understand it correctly they did it on a on a joke and a whim that ah, no that's the same stuff that's in chocolate milk let's just put chocolate milk as one of the the things and it worked Yeah, most of them are probably high fat, probably made with, uh, well, and that's just it. You have to take a look at it. Most of them are probably made with whole milk. Um, I got the little guy, uh, my eight-year-old loves chocolate milk, and, I mean, I can't drink the stuff anymore, but I take one sip of that, and it's like drinking cream. I mean, it's, you can tell there's a big difference between that and skim, so they're using whole milk in there. Uh, if you make it yourself, I, you know, we have skim milk in our house, so that would bring the fat down. But the fat is not in the chocolate part of it, the fat's in the milk. So, depending on if you make it yourself or buy it. Most of them, you can get skim chocolate milk, but most of them are, are whole milk. At least at Kroger. Good? Thank you very much. Like I said, I'll be happy to, to email any of this stuff. Should I? Should I just?